Good morning. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we meet and we learn from each other today on country. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land where I live, work and write. I pay my sincere respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be here with us this morning. Thank you and welcome to this, the last Scholar Talk for 2020. And it's a very special edition of the Scholar Talk series. My name is Rachel Franks and I'm the coordinator of scholarship at the State Library of New South Wales. And this series is one of the best parts of my job, helping fellows celebrate and share the research that they've done for usually about a year on site at the library. Today is all about early children's literature here in Australia. And if we were actually on site at the library, we would have probably pulled out a first edition of the book that's going to be the focus of today's talk. But like many of you, I'm still working from home. So the best I was able to do was find my very first lady book, book from when I was a child. Uh, Mr. Badger comes to the rescue. Um, of course, Different types of books are being spoken about today and Kate Forsyth's new book with her sister Searching for Charlotte is available. It came out literally on Sunday, but there are plenty of copies in the library shop. And if you would like to order the book online, this is a special code that you can use. SFC Searching for Charlotte 311 2020. And I'll pull that code up again at the end of the talk if you would like to purchase that online from the library. And of course, if you have any questions for Kate Forsyth, who is our 2019 Keysing Fellow, you can just ask those through the chat. But now I'll hand over to Kate. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me here today for my scholar talk. Um, as you can see, I'm also um, speaking from home, so you get to have a lovely glimpse into my own writing space. I've got a beautiful slideshow to share with you this morning, so if you just give me a moment, I'll get it up. I couldn't um, resist the opportunity to share with you some of the amazing treasures that the Mitchell Library has that pertains to my great 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 grandmother. That's lovely, I hope that you can all see this. So Searching for Charlotte, the fascinating story of Australia's first children's book uh, came out on the 1st of November, so on Sunday. And um, the beautiful art you can see on the cover was all painted by my great, 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 great grandmother um, who was Australia's first children's author. So I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, ever since I was a little girl, all that I can remember is longing to spend my days reading, writing, daydreaming, and um, creating beautiful stories. Um, my mother says that I was writing as soon as I could hold a pencil. Um, I often say that writing is in my blood because I come from a long line of writers stretching back into the dim recesses of history. Um, my sister is also a, a writer. That's a cute picture of us when we were little girls together. And here are just some of the books that we have both published. Between us, we have published more than 80 books. And my brother Nick has also had more than 10 books published. So the three of us have published 90 books together. So as you can see, writing is something that's very, very important in our family. Um, and uh, this, I think, rises from the fact that when we were um, when we were young, our grandmother and our grandfather, whose beautiful photographs you can see on the screen, used to take us down um, to uh, see Oldbury, um, this uh, amazing estate in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales. And they would tell us all these romantic stories about our great, 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 great grandmother who wrote Australia's first children's book. Her life was filled with romance, drama and tragedy. And it was completely um, inspiring to us 
Uh, we were fascinated by her from a very young age. Um, Charlotte Waring Atkinson was born in London in 1796 to a family who can trace their lineage back to a Norman knight who sailed to England with William the Conqueror and fought at his side at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. According to our family myth, he was rewarded for his loyalty and his courage with uh, estates and a, a title and the uh, hand of the king's daughter in marriage. Um, up until the 17th century, the de Waring family were a powerful and wealthy family in England. Um, they had a wonderful moated manor house um, called uh, you know, of the Lee, and um, I so wish that that had been kept in the family and that we could go there now. Um, Charlotte was a, a, a precocious child. She was writing and reading and drawing from a very young age, and um, she was unusually highly educated for her time. Um, this beautiful uh, picture of a baby owl is one of her artworks and one of my own favorites of her work. She was um, a great lover of animals. Um, when she was a young woman, um, her father lost his wealth during the Napoleonic Wars and Charlotte had to go out and work as a governess. Um, it's just like an, uh, a Bronte novel. And we like to imagine that this sketch of hers is a representation of what her life was like when she was um, only 15 and working in grand houses as a governess. Um, when she was about 30, she saw an advertisement for a job as a governess to the MacArthur family in far off Sydney, New South Wales. And so she decided that she was going to apply for this job. She wanted to transform her life and, and live an independent life. When she turned up for the job interview, there were 24 other governesses all in a row. I imagine very prim and proper with the high necked blouses and the button up boots, but not one of them was brave enough to make that dangerous journey to, to the other side of the world. Only Charlotte accepted the challenge, but she told the MacArthur's represent representative, I will sail, I will go to Australia, but I must travel first class. I, I love that. Uh, when she was sailing on the Cumberland, when she first went onto the ship to sail to Australia, she met a handsome young man who tipped his hat to her as he came up the gangplank. And his name was James Atkinson. And he was an um, uh, early settler. Um, and it was love at first sight. Within three weeks, they were engaged to be married. According to our family law, there was a great storm at sea and Charlotte was knocked off her feet and almost swept under the water and Charlotte swooped down and saved her life and then he wrapped her in his plaid cloak to keep her warm and dry and um, we, uh, the extract that you see from um, her writing actually comes from her shipboard um, journal when she describes this experience of almost being drowned. Um, Charlotte and James were married and he built her a beautiful sandstone house named Oldbury near Sutton Forest, a place that my grandparents used to take us to look at when we were little kids. They were very, very happy there. Um, they had four children in quick succession, Charlotte Elizabeth, Jane Emily, James John and Caroline Louisa, who was called by her second name. When Louisa was still just a newborn, James Atkinson died tragically from typhoid and Charlotte was left a young widow struggling to run a vast property worked mainly by convicts. In January 1836, she rode out with her overseer, a man named Char um, George Barton, and they were attacked by bush rangers. Barton was viciously flogged we don't know what the bushrangers did to Charlotte, but considering that one of them was uh, John Lynch, known as the Berrima axe murderer, we fear the worst. It was a very violent encounter and must have been very frightening. 
The attack was reported in the Sydney Herald, and three weeks later, Charlotte Waring Atkinson made the worst mistake of her life. She married George Barton, the man who had been um, flogged. He proved to be a violent drunkard. And three years later, Charlotte packed up her four young children and she fled Oldbury, taking only what she could carry on the backs of a few bullocks. They rode through the impenetrable gorges of the Shoalhaven River on horseback and eventually made it to Sydney, um, to safety in Sydney. Um, this is a picture of uh, John Lynch, the bushranger, who um, the Berma axe murderer, as he was known at that time. Um, when they uh, arrived in Sydney, she had nothing. Um, she was she, she was penniless, um, and as uh, her solicitor wrote in her, her deposition to the courts, she and the children are literally starving. Charlotte applied to the courts to be paid an income from her late husband's estate. But in retaliation, the trustees of that estate um, declared she was not a fit and proper person to be the guardian of the infants in consequence of her imprudent intermarriage with George Barton. And so they applied to the courts that her four children be given into the guardianship of a man. They didn't care who, as long as he was male. Charlotte fought through the courts of New South Wales to retain custody of her own children. And on the 9th of July, 1841, the Chief Justice, Sir James Downing, found emphatically in her favour. It was the first time in Australian legal history that a woman was permitted to keep custody of her own children. It's a landmark battle for women's rights in this country and indeed in the world. This beautiful painting that you see here is one of the treasures of the Mitchell Library and it was painted by Charlotte's eldest daughter, Charlotte Elizabeth, who is my great, great, great grandmother. In December 1841, five months after she won her court case, a mother's offering to her children by a lady long resident in New South Wales was published just in time for Christmas. And this picture that I have on the screen is actually the edition that is owned by the Mitchell Library. It's an absolute treasure. Um, there's only a few of them left in the world and it's enormously precious. Australia's first children's book, the first book to describe the Australian landscape and have Australian children and their adventures in an Australian setting. The first children's book to describe Australian history, Australian flora and fauna, and also to describe the plight of the First Nations people and the catastrophic effect of colonialism on their lives. Um, this beautiful edition owned by um, the Mitchell Library has been specially bound in red leather and gilt. And you can see on the title page, a pencil drawing that was done by Charlotte Waring Atkinson herself. And it's attributed, it's signed, that says by the author. I don't know if you can see that, but this book is the only known autographed copy of a mother's offering to her children by a lady long resident in New South Wales. And I think it's incredibly touching that she signs it, the author. It's still anonymous, even in a gift to a, a loved one. Now, when um, 2021 is the um, 180th anniversary of the publication of A Mother's Offering, and we felt, um, my sister and I felt it was so important that we write this book about her and that we, um, we rescue her from oblivion, really. Um, and I have to say that without the Nancy Kissing Fellowship, um, I would not have been able to spend three years reading, um, re researching and writing this book about my brave and clever ancestor. Um, I had to um, take a long break from my usual work of you know, writing, publishing, touring and teaching to have the time and it was an enormous research task. Um, some of our most beautiful discoveries were made in the archives of the Mitchell Library. Um, library. This is one of them. This is actually a um, handwritten memoir. It was written by Louisa Atkinson, Charlotte's youngest daughter, 
who's the first Australian born female novelist, journalist, and botanist. She wrote it for her, her baby daughter, whose name was Louise. And you can see the top line says, the Warings are descended from the Norman family of de Varenne. William de Varenne came to England with, the, with William the Conqueror. The name has been corrupted into Waring within the last 200 years. D discovering this in the Mitchell archives made us laugh because we'd always thought that story of the Norman knight fighting at the Battle of Hastings had been incredibly romanticized. And yet here we find that our great, 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 great aunt had heard the same story. One of the boxes in, in the Mitchell Library had been uh, labeled Jane Emily Atkinson, album of watercolors around 1848, a gift to her Emily, not her work, certainly by her brother, but when we pulled up this box, we made um, this box, we found the astonishing discovery that it was actually a sketchbook that had been written in and, um, and drawn and painted in by Charlotte Waring Atkinson herself. You can see here on the screen, the handwritten note that says certainly by her mother, but because of the old fashioned writing, it's, it was um, misread as brother. And so this treasure has been lost and hidden for many, many years. We recognize it straight away because we have had the great privilege of seeing um, another sketchbook by Charlotte Waring Atkinson, which contains um, her beautiful artwork that was used on the front of the book and an inscription where uh, to a beloved child on her birthday signed by Charlotte Atkinson. And so we recognized her handwriting straight away. Apart from the the fact that we had found this sketchbook long thought lost. Um, it was an incredible discovery for us because it was full of family portraits. This is a self portrait, we believe, of Charlotte wearing Atkinson herself. And as you can see, it's a beautiful image of her. Um, and she's wrapped in a plaid cloak. And this was, um, we feel, uh, Charlotte illustrating the story of how she came to meet the children's father, James Atkinson, and how he wrapped her in the pad cloak after that great storm at sea. We love this self-portrait so much because it um, confirms the old history that was passed down to us, um, parent to child for generations. Another of the beautiful treasures in this book was a portrait of um, Louisa Atkinson, Australia's first um, female novelist beautifully painted here. Um, we know that it is Louisa because we have an existing, or Mitchell Library has an existing painting of her, which was done by our great, 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 great aunt, um, I'm sorry, grandmother, Charlotte Elizabeth. And then this beautiful portrait, um, a photographic locket, which was carried by the, the little baby, Louise. Now, what I didn't tell you is that um, Louisa Atkinson never had a chance to finish her handwritten memoir to her daughter. Um, she saw her husband's horse come galloping home riderless and she had a heart attack and dropped dead by the cradle of her daughter when the baby was only a few days old. And so Louise Calvert, her daughter, treasured this painting of Louisa Atkinson all of her life and it too is in the Mitchell Library. And finally, this is probably the most exciting discovery at all. When we were um, reading through the primary sources um, held in both the Mitchell Library and the National Library of Australia, we found a number of different sources which attributed more than one work to um, Charlotte Waring Atkinson. Um, she was described as the author of several charming works for children. And this really puzzled us because we'd only ever heard of one, A Mother's Offering to Her Children by Lady Long Resident. And we thought, what, is it possible that she'd had other books or stories published? Marcy Muir um, is uh, Charlotte Waring Atkinson's biographer um, and was the one that first discovered the identity of a lady first resident in New South Wales. In her papers, we found uh, just a, scri a scribbled handwritten note on the back of an envelope or a scrap of paper. 
and it referred to uh, P and P tails, question mark. And I wondered what P and P tails could possibly mean. And so um, we went on a, uh, it was really like being a literary detective. I searched through all um, the accounts of early colonial children's fiction. And I discovered that there was a book called um, Amusing and Instructive Stories by Peter Prattle, which had been published in 1832. And it contained a story about um, the happy grandmother and her grandchildren who left England and sailed to a better life in Australia. Um, and this story, the, the, the happy grandmother, is known as the very first children's story to have an Australian setting. And it was published in 1832, so almost 10 years before Mother's Offering to her children. Um, in the Mitchell Library, I called up um, their copy of this book. And what I discovered is that there was more than one book. There was actually a number of different editions with different names. Sometimes it was called Peter Prattle's um, Amusing Tales. Sometimes it was Peter Prattle's Cheerful Tales. And um, in the 1840s, about 1842, so a year after the publication of A Mother's Offering to Her Children, it was republished with more poems and stories in it. Now, I read this book in um, the special collections room at the Mitchell Library, and I undertook a kind of linguistics forensic of it. And I came to realize that I believe P Peter Prattle was Charlotte Waring Atkinson. Um, there were so many similarities between it, the language, the construction of the sentences, the use of a conversational style of instruction, um, the love of animals and the desire to teach uh, the young to be gentle and kind to, to all living creatures, um, poetry, um, a strong um, faith and spirituality. It was all there. And not only that, but Peter Prattle's tales are illustrated. And it seems clear to me that the illustrations were also done by Charlotte. And you can probably see similarities between them with the art that I've, I've shared with you today. If so, this drawing of a kangaroo lapping tea here is one of the earliest drawings of a kangaroo. This came out in 1832. Um, so that is uh, the story of um, the, just some of the extraordinary discoveries that were made during the research and writing of Searching for Charlotte, the fascinating story of Australia's first children's author. Um, it's been an extraordinary journey. It's been um, exhausting and challenging and joyous. And um, it's a book that I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of. Um, I feel closer to my great, 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 great grandmother than I ever have before. And I feel that my sister and I have worked together to rescue her from oblivion because of course, um, very few people in Australia know about her book or know about her life of romance, drama and tragedy. Um, I would very much like to take this opportunity to thank the State Library of New South Wales um, for um, honouring me with the Nancy Keesing Fellowship for 2019. I would particularly like to thank Richard Neville and Rachel Fanks and the lovely staff of the Special Collections who were very patient with me constantly calling up dusty archive boxes. Um, I am particularly proud of the fact that I was awarded the Nancy Keesing Fellowship because Nancy Keesing was a poet and an author herself. And she had a particular interest in the work of the early colonial women writers. She wrote many a book or essay about them herself. I think that she would have been glad to know that her legacy went towards um, rescuing Charlotte Waring Atkinson from um, being so unjustly forgotten. And so I very much like to thank her husband and her family for setting up this fellowship. 
Um, I'm going to um, stop there and hope that um, you will have some questions to ask me. Thank you, Rachel. So many questions, Kate. Uh, first, a couple of comments. People are very delighted that your dress perfectly matches the cover of the book. Um, this is not easy. Um, the, first, and my cup. <laughs> um, the first question is around her work as a governess. So presumably she didn't work for the MacArthur's? Um, no, she was, um, uh, she was hired to uh, uh, tutor the children of Hannibal Hawkins MacArthur. And um, when she arrived in Sydney, in 1826, she worked for almost a year for the MacArthur family. And, um, you know, their children were very, very fond of her and she maintained um, a warm and loving relationship with them for, you know, the rest of her life, um, you know, many letters and cards. Um, so she married James Atkinson um, about a year after her arrival in, in Sydney. And someone else is commenting on just what a wonderful way to find out about some of your own family history, but to bring to life a story that is actually very important for many of us. Um, anyone who enjoyed reading or is encouraging others to read, especially as a little person. But what was the most challenging aspect of doing something that's a scholarly project, but also a very personal project? I think that you've um, touched upon what was the most challenging um, challenging aspect of it, which was that it was both an immense task of research, and many of the things that we um, that we discovered were unknown about her life. Um, we were very, very lucky in that um, she wrote, you know, a journal, you know, describing her journey on the ship out to um, Sydney, and we of course have her her published works that we could examine. But many um, of the family papers were lost. Um, her granddaughter, Louise Calvert, um, whose mother died so tragically when she was only a baby, dropping dead by her cradle, um, she grew up practically an orphan because her, her father, James Calvert, died when she was still young. And when she was about 14 or 15 years old, um, the the house, Aubrey, was to be sold. And she was allowed to, um, to go to the house and fill up her arms with whatever she could carry. She had to walk five miles over the countryside to Oldbury and grab whatever she could and then carry it home. And everything else was burnt in a massive bonfire. Sketchbooks, letters, oh. first editions, um, everything. And so our job would have been infinitely easier if Louise Snowden had been allowed to take a bullet dray <laughs> and rescue. Now, those treasures are the things that are now in the um, Mitchell Library archives and also at the National Library of Australia. And without those things, our job would have been infinitely harder. Um, now, you know, I, you know, most of my novels are research intensive anyway. Um, many of my novels deal with the lives of forgotten women. And I'm used to the fact that um, many women's lives go unrecorded in the, word, in, in, in the words of John Keats, their lives are writ on water. And I'm, so I'm used to the difficulty of researching, um, you know, women who there's, there's so little trace left of, of their lives and their loves and their struggles. Um, but because I was writing um, with my sister, the, the, the story of our great, 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 great grandmother, this was the story of our own family. This was the story of someone of our blood and all her, all her struggles and all of her, tra her travails, her, her grief at the loss of her husband at such a young age that the horror of the bushranger attack, the fear of what the bushrangers might have done to her on that day. We know that John Lynch was a rapist as well as a murderer, and we fear that she may have suffered sexual violence. Our pity for her, her struggle to continue to um, protect her children, her marriage to a violent drunkard, and her, um, you know, she's a survivor of domestic violence, her her flight 
and her being left penniless and struggling at that time in the 1840s to support herself and her four children, it, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. And there were many times while we were writing this that, that you know, we, we were reduced to tears. And I remember once Linda and I were sobbing over, you know, I think it might have been the tragic death of one of her, her descendants. And my husband said to me, how can you be so upset? She lived so long ago. We said, but we've spent the last three years in her skin, living her life. We feel so close to her. Her grief is our grief. And so that was the most difficult part of writing the book was how we did not expect that would affect us so deeply and we would find it so moving. And so um, I'm actually getting a little bit teary even talking about it now. There you go. So, um, and yet the things that she lived through and suffered, these are things that women are still, uh, you know, struggling with today. And that really struck us as well. We had begun by thinking it was, it was all so long ago and what she had lived through was the experience of colonial Australian women. But in actual fact, it's the experience of so many women still. And that was very moving for us as well. That actually leads into another question. So was she able to draw on the support of other women as she was struggling? I mean, the, the question that's come through is specifically, um, was she involved in Sydney's literary society, which you know, was so when um, to help? When James and Charlotte were living at Oldbury, they were part of a, um, a very warm and intimate circle of, um, you know, colonial settlers. And, they, um, you know, there were other women that were living on the estate that she was friends with. And, um, and you know, they used to have gatherings and picnics and horse races, and they used to, you know, come together and, and, sh and share books and play the piano and have music nights. Um, but after she fled Oldbury, uh, she was alone. She was very much alone. Um, it took her a while to reach Sydney. And then she was, um, you know, uh, as soon as she arrived in Sydney, the court case over the custodianship of her four young children began. So all of her energies were poured into fighting. And she, she fought um, again and again and again, and was constantly told no, a woman is not capable of caring for her children. Um, the, the guardianship was actually given to a young man who was only in his early 20s and had only just arrived in, in the colony and had never met the children. So they were taking her four children, all under the age of nine, and giving them into the care of a strange man. It's unthinkable now. All of her energies were taken in, into this fight. At one point, she was charged with contempt of court for impertinence and I oh, love that as well good honor you know you can just imagine she was only a very small woman and she would have been very poor shabbily dressed standing up in court and fighting like a tigress for her children's lives once she won the court battle she was given a very very small stipend um that actually took a long time for her to, to be paid that and then she was writing the book uh, once the book came out, um, you know, we know that it was a success. It was very um, warmly received. It was critically um, uh, acclaimed. But it, she, she wrote it anonymously by a lady long resident in New South Wales. Um, and one of the reasons why she did that, we think, is because as part of the court case, her former husband, who she was still legally married to but separated from, um, he uh, made a scandalous disposition, accusing her of all, all kinds of scandalous behaviours, which, you know, we know was um, him striking out at her. And he later retracted it, but I think the damage would have been done. Mm -hmm. I think Charlotte would have found um, it humiliating, and I think that Sydney society would have been shocked by the whole you know, you know, by the whole circumstances. Um, and you must remember that she had four young children and she homeschooled them all. They were all, um, you know, once they began to go to school, uh, they were all proved to have a very high level of education. And indeed she um, taught Louisa Atkinson herself. Um, and I, 
you know, Louise Atkinson was absolutely brilliant, as you can tell from her, her work as a botanist and as an artist and as a writer. Somebody's asking about the history of the publication itself, so that that very special first edition that you were pointing out, but also if there have ever been any plans to republish her work, um, the so, sketchbooks. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the book was published in 1841, and for a long, long time, um, uh, uh, copies of it were very, very rare. Um, I believe the last time um, a first edition copy sold, it, it was worth about $75,000. Um, so you, your Mitchell first edition copy <laughs> autographed by the author has got to be, well, it's priceless. In 1979, um, a facsimile edition was published, which is this one, A Mother's Offering to Her Children by Lady Long, resident in New South Wales. It was um, had an intro introduction by Rosemary uh, Whiteson, or Whiten, uh, who was um, a... a academic who specialised in Australian children's literature. And in this introduction, she speaks about the fact that no one knows who wrote the book. So she says, um, uh, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, um, anyway, she, she, she talks about that, um, the fact that no one knows who wrote it but that the uh, dedication purports to have been written in Sydney in October 1841, and that some people think that it might have been Lady Gordon Bremer who wrote it, but no one knows. Now, that was in 1979. It wasn't until Marcy Muir sold this puzzling literary mystery in the 1980s that um, the literary community knew who wrote the book. We, of course, in the family always knew. We didn't really know that it was unknown. We had no idea that people were racking their brains trying to identify the author of this oh, piece of interesting. Australian literary history. Mm. So another tricky family history question for you. Somebody's asking if you were able to confirm Charlotte's connection to Charles Darwin. Oh, yes, absolutely. So um, Charlotte uh, Waring um, was Charles Darwin's fifth cousin once removed which um, I know is, uh, seems distant, but um, we, in our family, we still have connections with many of our extended family and distant kin. And the, the relationship was known and acknowledged at the time. There's actually um, letters between the Warings and the Darwins um, that are existent. Um, Charles Darwin and Ch and Charlotte um, Waring were actually quite close in age. There was only 12 years between them. And when Charles Darwin uh, visited Sydney here um, in the 1830s, um, it's believed that he and Charlotte met. Um, one, of my, um, one of my research tasks during my fellowship was to, to try and find evidence of this um, <laughs> because it's one of those family stories that was passed down. Mm -hmm. And so in our family, you know, it, it, um, everyone had heard from a great aunt or grandparent or someone in their history. Oh yes, Charles Darwin visited Charlotte at Oldbury when he was in Sydney. But um, the, 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 there are three days that are empty in Charles Darwin's diary and he, um, he, he, I read the diary and I've examined it quite closely and he wrote um, about everything. And, um, but, we, but we wonder, because he knew that the diary was to be published when he returned to Sydney, we wonder if perhaps he didn't write about visiting his cousin in order to um, you know, preserve her privacy. Um, it was certainly possible for him to have traveled from Sydney down to Sutton Forest and back in those three days. And he has quite a long entry after the missing three days where he talks about um, conversations about what life was like in the colonies and how hard it was to raise children here and how few bookstores there were, which indicates that he was speaking to someone in that time. It could have been Charlotte. The other thing that is, is extraordinary is that while um, D Charles Darwin was in Sydney, he managed to gather um, 
hundreds and hundreds of different types of beetles and moths and other insects. And yet there is no time for him to have gone insect hunting because we know what he did on every single day except for these three days. So Charlotte Waring Atkinson was also a keen um, you know, botanist and um, entomologist. If you have a look at the cover of her book, you can see that she, that she was always painting butterflies and beetles and bees. Um, and so we like to think that perhaps they went insect hunting together down <laughs> at the Sutton Forest and that perhaps Charlotte gave him some of her collections of, of you know, local flora and fauna and insects. Um, and so that perhaps that is why he, he managed to gather this astonishing collection of insects in the few, in the week that he was here in Sydney. Is that Sutton Forest property still there? Yes, Oldbury um, is still there. It's, um, it's quite close to the Sutton Forest Church in the Southern Highlands. It's on um, Oldbury Road. Um, it's in private ha um, hands and has been for many, many years. It's one of the finest examples of um, domestic colonial architecture left as a house. I, it hasn't been turned into a museum Sometimes. like Borkloo's house or Elizabeth house. It's still lived and it's still a home. And that makes it, I think, extra special. Um, it's uh, because it's a private home, it means that we can't go there and traps all over it and look to see if the bullet hole is still in the window where the one of the bush rangers shot through the drawing room window and um, but um, occasionally they open up their very beautiful gardens um, and have a, an, an, an open day and um, and we've been lucky enough to to be able to visit the house then um, it's very very beautiful um, when we were kids our grandparents would drive down the road and then would peer at the house through the fence. So we only ever saw it from a distance and that might have given it that enchanting fairy tale quality that we remember from our childhood. We have a few questions about work process. So the first is, where do you even start researching histories of forgotten women? Uh, you've already mentioned how much doesn't survive. So if somebody was looking for a story like this, a story of recovery, where would they start? So um, I always like to start uh, with the big picture um, so that I, I understand the place and the time. Um, because, you know, we, our psyche is always shaped by our life, our times. And so if you, you, you need to understand what it was like for women in the, you know, in the early 19th century, um, how they were treated, how they were educated, what they read, what they wore, what they ate. The social history is always really, really important to me. Um, I always love primary sources. And so to read the letters and diaries of other women of the time, this is especially useful if they come from the same class and they have the same level of education as the woman that you are researching, because it gives you a sense of their voice, how they might have spoken and how they express themselves in word, what type of language uh, they would have used and what they believed in. Um, you know, and, you know, so uh, we were reading the uh, many wonderful collectors letters of other colonial women, as well as reading about um, all the things that we could get that were written by Charlotte herself. Um, establishing a timeline is incredibly important so that you that you have a strong sense of the chronology of events in the I mean their lives and that begins to give you a sense of the shape of the structure of your own book. Um, understanding um, you know reading as much as you can. You know, so, for example, um, Charlotte Waring Atkinson was born between um, Charlotte Bronte and Jane Austen, almost exactly halfway between their birth dates. And both Belinda and I 
uh, adore the work of the Bonte sisters and of Jane Austen. And so when we were in the UK, um, we did a literary pilgrimage to the houses, you know, Jane Austen's house and, and the Bonte parsonage. And we read their works. We read biographies about them. We read as many primary you know, letters, etc. Jane Austen's letters are delightful. And that also helped us have a sense but um, understanding how Charlotte Bronte and Jane Austen came to be published, what their print runs were, how they were paid, how the books were, um, you know, came to be published, helped us understand how Charlotte might have come to have her book published as well. So it was the practical side of their lives as well as the creative side to their life that helped us un understand her. So another question about the, the process is, so you and Belinda are well-established authors, each in your own right. So how did you go about collaborating, collaborating on this important project and sharing the workload? It's a, a, a really good question and, not, and one that we are being asked a lot. Um, and people seem to find it fascinating. Um, the other question we are asked most often is, did you fight all the time? And are you still <laughs> talking to, you, uh, to each other? But, you know, Belinda and I are both very, very experienced authors. This is how we make our living. We've been published for 20 years or more. And um, we, uh, uh, we understood that it was going to be a very um, overwhelming task. Um, we... Once we decided that we were going to write this book together, um, we sat down, we actually went out to lunch and we ordered a bottle of champagne and we sat down and we laid out um, a, a plan for the book, um, the key events in Charlotte's life. And then, um, which you know, gave us a chronology and a structure for the book. And then we simply um, decided who was going to write what we had made the decision that we weren't going to work together, that we would each have um, uh, our own chapters. We would do all the research, writing, editing, rewriting of that chapter, and that chapter would be told in our own voice. We wouldn't try and create a royal we. So my chapters have written by Kate underneath them, and the beautiful picture of the baby owl, which is one of my favourite images of, of Charlotte's art. It's very cute. It's adorable, isn't it? And then um, I, I would say, I have always wondered what happened that day. Belinda and I um, went together to, you know, to see the house. Um, and occasionally I'd even say, Belinda thinks I shouldn't say that, but... Um, <laughs> No, Belinda thinks Charlotte would never have said that. So I'm just letting you know, Belinda doesn't agree. <laughs> and she did the same in her chapters. Her chapters were all written in her voice from her point of view. And um, this meant that um, we, we made the decision to respect the integrity of each other's work and to give the other one complete creative freedom to write their chapters how they thought mm -hmm. best. Now, we certainly um, read each other's work. Um, occasionally, if a mistake had crept in, um, we'd say, oh, by the way, like I have a dreadful habit of transposing numbers. So I would always write 1841 as something like 1814, even though in my mind I knew it was 1841. Yeah. And Belinda would just go, oh, you transposed the numbers again, darling. Um, and every now and again, we, um, we had repetitions. We both loved certain aspects of her book and we wanted to quote from that book in our section. Or we both thought that, um, you know, for example, the attack of the Bush Ranger, we both deal with in slightly different ways um, because we both felt very passionately about, um, you know, examining that in our own voices. Um, and we simply would negotiate then, um, you know, it was true that a passage I loved worked better in Belinda's chapter, so I'd let her have it. But then later I'd go, well, you got that one, so I, I get to have this one. And um, it was actually a really beautiful, joyous um, experience working so closely with her, particularly when we travelled to the UK together with our daughters. Mm -hmm. 
So my daughter was 15 years old, which was the age that Charlotte was when she first went out to work as a governess. And that really made it so poignant for me. I was imagining my beautiful young daughter having to go and live with strangers and teach their children and how lonely she would have been and how frightened she would have been and how much strength of character it would have taken her to, to undertake that task. And Belinda's daughter was 21 and you know she was still working as a governess at 21. So that was really special to us to share that experience with our daughters. You've mentioned some of um, the views and the observations of New South Wales that come through in the book. Somebody's asking quite specifically, do you know what um, Charlotte thought of the colonial and convict systems? Um, it's a very, very good question. Um, the Oldbury was mainly worked by convicts. And so, um, you know, she would have had a first-hand experience mm. of what it, 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 it would be like. And John Lynch, of course, the Berrimah Axe murderer, the, you know, the bushranger who attacked her and George Barton that day had been, had been a convict. Um, but uh, James and Charlotte were known, um, you know, for their great um, generosity of spirit and their um, you know, great sense of justice. James Atkinson eventually became a magistrate. And we know that, um, uh, that there were a number of men um, who had been sent out to Australia as convicts who worked at Oldbury and they had left their families behind them in England. And those families, their wives and their children were in poor houses and they were ill and they were you know, living in dire poverty and in um, unspeakable circumstances. And um, James and Charlotte paid for their families to be bought out and then gave them cottages on, on the land. And those families then were reunited and were able to work. And we are still um, in contact with the descendants of some of those families who, you know, contact us to thank us for our great, 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 great grandparents, um, generosity and clemency. So we don't know much more than that. Um, she doesn't write about it in um, much in a mother's offering to her children. She's more concerned with, um, you know, the, the book is an educational treatise to help children understand mm. um, you know, geology and conchology and, you know, uh, botany and, um, you know, much more, uh, you know, uh, they're like lessons to help her children and other children learn about Australia. Um, so that's another question. Was her audience specifically for children in New South Wales or did she see this as a, a useful book? for children in England as well to learn about Australia? So the Peter Prattle books were published in London and they um, and the, the collections of stories and poems and um, many of them are set in England. There's only you know, the story of the happy grandmother and her grandchildren who came to Australia is the only one that has an Australian setting. And that was a uh, book was published in 1832, which was, um, you know, quite a short time after she first arrived in this country. A Mother's Offering to Her Children was absolutely, without doubt, um, intended for an Australian audience. And I'll just read to you her, her dedication, which makes that quite clear. So uh, she writes, to Master Reginald Gipps, son of His Excellency Sir George Gipps, Governor of New South Wales and its dependencies, this little work is dedicated by permission and the author hopes the incidents it contains may afford him some little entertainment in the perusal. Its principal merit is the truth of the subjects narrated, the accounts of the medical shipwrecks being drawn from printed sources. It perhaps may claim some trifling merit also from being the first work written in the colony expressly for children. So Charlotte knew that she was writing the first children's book to be published in Australia. And she knew that she was uh, writing in order to educate the children of Australian settlers about life in the colonies. It, it, it was published in Sydney and it would only have been distributed in Sydney. 
lots of questions coming through, lots of people sharing their own experiences, which is really lovely, of um, excursions to Oldbury, not quite peering through the fence, but certainly <laughs> on an open day. Um, somebody's mentioned a book on agriculture that James Atkinson um, wrote. An account of the state of agriculture and grape in, in New South Wales. South Wales. <laughs> um, people are saying they're very grateful that you've been able to demystify so many stories in just one session. And I've been busy taking notes, so I just have to juggle things over here a little bit. So um, as we mentioned at the beginning, the book is available in all good bookstores everywhere. But if you are at the library or you'd like to um, shop online at the library's bookshop, um, I'll just make sure you can see that properly. Um, the joys of doing television work, it's a little bit technically tricky. <laughs> um, so you can use that code and the shop will not only give you a discount, but they will give you a copy of the book that Kate and Belinda signed yesterday. So you're probably grateful that you're not holding a pen this morning. <laughs> we have been, we have signed hundreds and hundreds of books in the last few days since the book came out. Um, and just one more thing, the library asked me to mention that they have free Australian postage. And so if you can, oh. read them, you can order the book over the phone and then they will post you a, a copy that's been signed by both Belinda and I anywhere in Australia at no cost to you. So support the library at the, I'm sorry, the bookstore at the library if you can. It's not supposed to be a commercial operation, but who can <laughs> know to free postage? So that is actually all we have time for on this fabulous finale to Scholar Talks 2020. We will be back with more fellows and more fascinating stories next year from February. Of course, the library doesn't stop. So please go to our website. There are so many events happening between now and the new year. Lots of different things. We have History Matters, the last one of those for this year, tomorrow night. Author Talks are coming conferences, public lectures, something for everybody, I think. So do have a look and we hope to see you online soon. Stay safe. Thanks, Kate. Thank you for having me. Bye.